Welcome. Tonight we want to have a quick discussion about ancient grains and what these grains uh, do for us and why these grains are important. This is in part um, with a bulk order that we're doing um, this coming weekend here for um, everyone along the Wasatch Front from Ogden all the way down through Utah County. And part of what we do here at Corazon Mills is not only provide these grains, um, these organic ancient grains that are incredibly healthy and good for us, but we also want you to understand how to use them so that when you purchase these grains or that you have discussions about these grains that you understand better how they work and why these grains would be a better choice. And so tonight we're going to be talking for the next 30 minutes or so about uh, Kamut and einkorn and spelt and emmer. These are four varieties of ancient wheat that we sell here um, and that some people who are gluten intolerant can actually eat without any issues. And so we'll talk more about that uh, here in a bit. And so for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to go through some, some uh, pieces of information that I think will be helpful. And if you have a question, then click on the chat option down below and type in your question. Everybody should be muted at this point and uh, we'll just um, save those questions until the end and then I'll be able to go back over those questions and answer those questions the last 10 minutes or so. And we should be able to end the meeting around 7.30 and uh, we'll go from there. So. One of the things that I really like about this concept of ancient grains is that we have a choice between modern grains and these ancient grains. And it wasn't that long ago that we didn't even have access to these ancient grains. And the reason that has changed now is because there are farmers and mills um, here in the States that are now willing to grow these grains in um, not so optimal conditions but provide these grains that are highly nutritious and um, give us other options uh, for different types of grains that we can use to feed our family. Um, these grains are more expensive for the farmer generally to grow. They don't yield as high per acre and they're uh, sometimes harder to not get out of the field but to process and bag, uh, particularly in the case of spelt and einkorn and emmer where they have uh, a casing around each kernel that has to come off before you can eat them. And so there's some additional processes there. So it increases the cost a bit um, by doing that. But these ancient grains are incredibly nutritious and they're good for us. And we now have them available to us through farmers from Montana down through Idaho and here in Utah and different mills um, that now provide these grains for us when we didn't have access to them uh, a while back. If you go to a health food food store and uh, grab some of these grains that we're we'll talking about. Um, they cost about twice as much as what we offer in, in some cases. And so we're just really pleased to have relationships with farmers and mills who care about the way that they grow their crops and uh, that we have access to them. One of the nice things that um, I enjoy is our relationship with the farmers and the mills that we do business with. We visit every farm uh, I know every farmer that we do business with, I know their families and the, the mills that we do business with as well. I visited every one of them and we will continue to do that so that you know that when you purchase grains from us or flour, that we've already done the homework and we know that these grains are clean, that they were grown from uh, farms that are sustainable, um, that they're organic in most cases, and that the land and the ground and the crops that um, these farmers provide are clean to begin with and, uh, and very beneficial to us. So I'm going to switch over to a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it'll help us to kind of keep the order of what I want to say and to give you an opportunity uh, to see uh, some of the things that um, we're going to be talking about here. And so tonight we're going to be talking about ancient grains in particular. And I'll, I'll uh, call out heirloom grains as well because there are some similarities between these uh, grains as well. Let me make sure I'm sharing my screen. Hang on just a second. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Okay, all right, here we go. All right, so we'll be talking about ancient grains and heirloom grains. Um, really quick, the difference between those two is um, age. When I talk about age, we're talking about ancient grains that have been around for thousands and thousands of years. In particular, we're talking about um, einkorn and emmer and kamut and spelt. Heirloom grains are those grains that are predecessors to the modern grain that we know of today, the red and white wheat. Uh, that we have uh, available to everyone. And so we're talking about heirloom grains that are a couple of hundred years old. Uh, some of those grains came from Europe when settlers came from Europe to America and also the Orient in some cases. Um, we grew those grains uh, over the past couple of centuries, but not so much over the last, say, 70 to 80 years. They fell out of favor because they didn't, um, some of these grains were uh, produce less per acre. They were more difficult to grow, but they, they were awesome grains. And now we have those grains back again in many cases. And so we'll talk about organics a little bit as well. So really quick, um, this is our contact information. I'll come back to this at the end of our presentation. But if you need to get a hold of us, uh, just know that the, we have our website, corazonmills.com. And there you can join our email list so that you get the emails that we send out every week or so when we get products in and we do classes. Um, online store is there as well where you can shop for these grains and flour and purchase those there. And what, what we do here is you very easily go to that online store and pick up your grains and flour or shop there and then come here to Pleasant Grove down here in Utah and pick them up. And then our email uh, address, corazonmills at gmail.com as well. And then we have a Facebook page, Corazon Mills, and also we're on Instagram as well at Corazon, Corazon Mills. So I'll come back to this. So let's talk about these particular varieties of ancient grain, uh, particularly wheat. And the reason we concentrate on wheat in this case is because this is what most people obviously will use for breads, for their quick breads, um, pancakes, waffles, you know, muffins, things you feed your family every day. And then we have gluten-free ancient grains as well. Uh, the oats, the quinoa, these smaller seeds and pseudo grains, amaranth, the millet, sorghum, and those types of things. We don't carry the seeds um, as much as we carry the wheat. And so tonight I want to concentrate on the wheat and why these grains are important and why um, they're important to choose for our family. And so when we talk about varieties of wheat, we're talking about grains that contain gluten, right? Red wheat has gluten, white hard wheat has gluten, in fact, very strong gluten, and it makes a great loaf of bread. When we talk about these ancient varieties of wheat like kamut and einkorn, spelt and emmer, these grains have lower amounts of gluten, and the gluten is more easily digested, right? The proteins in these grains are different. They are different makeup genetically, and these grains have never been hybridized or changed over the years, at least not by us. And that's another reason that we call them ancient is because man hasn't necessarily um, become involved in these grains except to bring them um, and to make them available to us. And so when we talk about these grains, we also talk about them not being uh, hybridized. A hybridized variety of wheat which is really common today, right? Your red and white wheat are all hybridized varieties, regardless of almost where they come from, is a cross between two different strains of wheat. And the reason they would be crossed is because a farmer might want to um, have a higher yield per acre, which is a strain of one wheat, and it might have another variety of wheat might be pest resistant, so you'll cross those two and have um, a hybrid variety that yields more per acre and is also pest resistant, right? There's just a dozen, dozen, hundreds of different um, crosses that can be done for different reasons. But ancient grains, these ancient varieties of wheat that we're talking about here, the einkorn, the kamut, spelt, and emmer, have not been hybridized. And they have been crossed uh, by nature, right, over time. So einkorn is probably <clears throat> um, the oldest variety of wheat that we know of. Let me just go back. 10,000 years old, 
uh, 8,000 years old, einkorn. All these uh, grains come from the Middle uh, Crescent, Fertile Crescent, um, back in um, the Middle East. And uh, the people back then uh, used these grains. They harvested them, they grew them, they domesticated them to the point where uh, they could use them. Um, wheat is also designated as a grass, and so before it becomes a wheat kernel, it looks like a grass, right, as it's growing. And so they're all classified as different um, varieties of grass. But they all have lower gluten and weaker gluten. And the proteins in these varieties of wheat are all um, all different to the point where they are, they're more digestible. Um, these grains, as we uh, are able to get them from the farmers and mills that we work with, are organic. And that's important to us because there are, there's a standard there that uh, means clean grains. Um, there are many, many standards that go along with the organic um, label. And part of that is that the farmer would grow these grains in a natural state, meaning that they're not using commercial pesticides or fertilizers or herbicides, that um, they grow these grains sustainably. They enrich the soils naturally by using cover crops or by using uh, crop rotation, for example. They use natural fertilizers and they regenerate the soils just like the soils generate and um, provide nutrients to the grains. And so it's a, it's a cyclical process, a natural process, and organics represents all of that. There's another term called biodynamics or bi, uh, bio, um, yeah, biodynamics uh, or biological that is similar to organics where a farmer may choose to not certify organically. Uh, they don't want to pay the fees. They don't want to go through the red tape. Um, but those standards are important. And so a biological farmer chooses to use organic standards, but not certify organic. We love those guys as well. And we work with biological farmers to bring clean grains in um, as well. The interesting thing about these grains is that <clears throat> for people who have gluten intolerance, for example, or gluten allergies, some of those people, in fact, many of them, and we have customers who have told me this many times, that they can con continue to consume these grains when they can't eat red or white wheat or flour made with red or white wheat, which is an important point, I think, to the digestibility and nutritional value of these grains. And so that includes einkorn especially. Uh, einkorn has very weak gluten and can be digested um, more easily and it hits the glycemic index more slowly. So that is important um, to these to the nutritional value of these grains and, and the nutrition of, of everyone involved. So especially if you have someone in your family that's gluten intolerant or has issues with, with grains, um, particularly red or white wheat, sometimes these grains can be the solution. I used to work in different bakeries back over the years and people would come into the bakeries uh, once in a while and ask, if we had another alternative besides whole wheat bread. They loved the bread, but they couldn't eat it because they were gluten intolerant or had issues that way. I never had a good answer for that until we started working with these ancient grains. And so we discovered and learned over the years as we worked with different people and different meals and the farmers that these grains are the answer to that question sometimes, that you can now eat grains again, particularly wheat, when these grains work for you. Not everyone, but in many cases they do, and not celiac. Right, so people who are celiac uh, can't consume these grains because they have gluten. Protein is higher in these grains as well, significantly higher in some cases. Um, a good red or white wheat that makes excellent bread for structure um, would generally have 11 to 13 percent gluten uh, or protein, which equates into really strong gluten. These grains, um, Kamut, Emmer, and and spelt and uh, einkorn have higher protein, but that protein is a different type of protein. And so it doesn't equate into stronger gluten. In fact, it's weaker gluten because of the genetic makeup of these grains. And when that happens, you're working with a grain that uh, is highly nutritious, but doesn't come together like red or white wheat or the regular flour that you would be used to using. You can make really good bread with these grains and I'll show you here in a minute uh, how that happens and what we've done with bread, but it's not all about bread either, right? Grains are used for many purposes, cereals and uh, quick breads and pancakes and waffles and muffins and lots of different things, cereal or uh, um, salads and side dishes, right? For pilafs and different things like that. 
And so there's, there's a lot of different things you can do with these grains, but just know that they have um, truly higher protein than the modern wheat that we work with uh, generally. They also sprout really well, meaning that if you want to use these grains for wheatgrass or if you want to grow them yourself, um, they, they actually grow really well. I've done that for the past few years in my own garden and it's kind of fun to watch these grains mature and grow and harvest these grains. And then and last, not most important, but truly important is that they taste really good. Meaning that Kamut has actually a sweeter flavor than regular wheat. And people love that flavor, both in the whole grain Kamut flour and the white Kamut flour. Also spelt, um, people throw these terms out all the time. Spelt is more earthy in flavor. Einkorn has a nutty flavor. <clears throat> Emmer somewhere in between. But they all have their own uh, nutritional profile and they all have their own flavor profile. Some of the best breads that I've come up with and that we have made is a combination of many of these. I can I combine Kamut and Spelt together all the time for breads and einkorn as well. Einkorn is interesting because it has really sticky gluten and you think you have to throw more flour at it to get that gluten, or sorry, to get the, the stickiness down and it just doesn't work that way. It's just the nature of the dough. So we have to learn how to work with these ancient grains. Um, some are more sticky than others. Um, some um, don't create a great structure for bread, but certainly well enough um, that it makes a, a decent loaf of bread. And I'll show you that here in a minute. But um, there's just some really good things you can do with these grains and good reasons why you would want to use them. So just really quick, I just want to show you this um, kind of a standards bullet point list for organics. This is the reason we like organics, right? And the farmer can grow uh, a crop that's not organic, but, same, but still follow these same principles here, right? There's no GMOs involved in these grains. In fact, there's no GMO wheat available on the market. You can't buy it even if you wanted to find it. So we love that about these. They don't use commercial pesticides or herbicides either. And so very clean, no Roundup. There's no glyphosate involved with growing these grains. They're certified by the state and the USDA. Uh, Department of Agriculture and overseen by, by a standard board there. They're very healthy, um, a little bit more expensive because of the certification cost when we talk about organic. But when you see that seal, that means something and it means something to us. And so that's where we uh, play in this market. Um, we really believe in organics and or crops that are grown in a similar way. So what can you do with these grains, right? Bread seems to be everybody's go-to um, solution to grains and wheat. Um, I'll show you some amazing, I think, loaves of bread that we've been able to make with these grains. Uh, but it's, again, it's not all about bread. So let me just go through these um, and show you what we've been able to do over the years. And when I teach bread classes, uh, whether it be sourdough or commercial yeast bread classes, these are the types of breads we talk about. So these can be either um, sourdough uh, or natural leavening, or they can be used with commercial yeast, right? So Kamut and Spelt and Einkorn all make really good bread. And th these were made with commercial yeast. I'll just go through a, a number of these. Kamut is one of my favorite grains. It has a really sweet flavor. And when you combine that with honey and butter and some other uh, enrichments, we call them, in a loaf of bread, you get an amazing loaf of bread that tastes really, really good. Um, here's one that we made with Kamut, whole grain. This is a whole grain loaf with rolled Kamut, which we can also get. Um, but I make a cereal out of this rolled Kamut, and then in this case, I combined that rolled Kamut, soaked it first, combined it with the loaf of bread, and made a fun loaf of bread that way. So I'm using these grains in a variety of different ways. Here's one that I made with Kamut whole grain with quinoa, in fact, red quinoa, which adds some style to the loaf. Kind of a fun way to do that. And then here's, um, here's spelt. Um, a commercial loaf on top, meaning used with commercial yeast, and also this uh, artisan style loaf down here in the lower right corner that I did um, a couple of months ago. This was a whole grain spelt loaf as well. And um, if I remember right, I probably added a cup of bread flour, really high quality organic bread flour to give the loaf some lift, but I baked it in a different way to give it an artisan style. So really crispy crust, Looks, um, looks pretty stylish. And then obviously I put my little logo on there for Corazon Mills, but um, I, I do these things all the time, right? And this is what, what I share with friends and family. Um, this one here, um, 
is uh, another loaf there. So they all look similar, um, but um, some good things you can do with, with those, right? This is einkorn. So when we talk about sprouting these grains, how would you do that? You can do it in a tray, right? You can sprout them that way. You can just soak your grains and sprout them that way. Or you, if you have a garden, you can grow these grains. They sprout really well. So this is the garden that I had a couple of years ago where if you look really closely, you can see the kamut berries or the kamut wheat in these furrows here, right? In a couple of weeks, it looked like this. And I dripped uh, my garden, so I have um, a drip system there, um, which works really well. So we talked about grasses, right? These are actually grasses before they head out and uh, grow the kernels. And then in a month or so, this is what it looked like. So this was my patch of Corazon wheat uh, that had the Kamut label on it, right? Most people know Corazon wheat as Kamut, same thing. Um, but this one was actually really successful. And then later on in the summer, it looked like this, right? And so this is near maturity and uh, you can get some, some great pictures here, but more importantly, you're growing grain that you know you can use and it's fun to acquire those skills and to know that you're growing wheat that's actually very nutritious and organically. So. I'm not, grant, I'm not a certified organic farmer, but the plot of land that I farm on, sorry, that I garden on, let's say, uh, I don't use commercial pesticides or anything like that. So these were grown very cleanly as well, following organic standards for the most part. And then <clears throat> just before harvest, before it turns golden brown, you get kamut that looks like this. So spelt would be similar, einkorn has a thinner, a tassel to it. Um, Kamut looks like this and then the, the beard or the the strands on the Kamut turn black. So you actually get a very golden colored kernel or head and then a black tassel which is pretty cool that way. So you can you can do a lot of different things with these grains and I just wanted to emphasize that uh, these grains can be grown, they can be eaten, they can be processed. Um, you choose what you want to do with these grains. Um, but you can you can choose those um, anytime you want. So we're grateful to have these grains available. And so let me just switch over and see if there are any questions. And um, let me just pause here for a second. All right, so there's a comment that wheatgrass can be used for fodder for chickens and rabbits. Ah, that's true, right? It's not all about green smoothies. And so... Um, yeah, lots of different reasons why you might want to grow these grains uh, if you're if you're using them for fodder for chickens and rabbits and and uh, your animals that way, then they're getting great nutrition as well, right? Um, let me know if you have any other questions. You can you can um, click on the chat item below and then just type your question there real quick, and we'll be able to answer those. Um, after we get done with this discussion tonight, um, I'll go back to the contact page and share that again so that if you have any follow-up questions that you might want to send us or that you might need uh, questions answered for, just send us an email and uh, we'll be able to get back to you on those questions. When I use Kamut, the final product isn't as smooth as when I use wheat. Is that normal? Um, I would answer that a couple of different ways. When, and I'm assuming we're talking about bread here or something that would be similar to bread. When you mill your own grains, meaning that you'll, let's assume you have a kitchen mill and you're milling grains for bread, you want to mill as, as fine as possible. The finer the flour, the better the bread. And the reason, the reason that's the case is because the larger the, the particle, the harder the, the gluten has a chance to, to bond. So you want your flour to be milled in the, on the finest setting possible. And you can't compare whole grain flour that's milled at home with white flour you get from the store. The white flour is ultra fine. And so when you mill it at home, it's going to be, it can be really fine depending on your mill, but um, it'll be a, it won't be coarse, it shouldn't be coarse. And uh, you can get it really smooth. On my mock mill that I use, um, I can ratchet down the stones really, really close so that I get actually really powdery fine uh, whole grain flour that's used that way too. So just pay attention to your mill and make sure that that uh, you're using it that way. Uh, another question is, um, uh, at one point you had honey available, so unrelated to grains, but when we talk about honey, 
when I talk about whole wheat bread, I always use honey in my bread. So we will have honey available again at the end of July, July through August. Uh, that's when we bring in the raw honey, uh, unfiltered, un amazing clover and um, alfalfa honey. So look forward to that. We'll send out emails when that time comes. Um, here's a question about fine flour. Would it be finer if I put it into a blender after milling? Um, let me back up and say that some people use their Blendtec or their Vitamix blenders to mill to actually make flour and sometimes they're advertised that way but a blender will never be able to cut the particles of the grain fine enough for good bread but this is in reverse actually would it be a finer flour if I put it into the blender after milling um, that's a great question I've never thought of it that way but I would actually try that and see what happens because once it's fine enough or as fine as you can get it in the mill, then the blender would theoretically blend it even further or break it down even further. So great question. I love the way that people think sometimes. And, um, but I, I, would, I would be very interested to see what happens. And so when you do that, if you do that, send us an email and uh, we'd be interested to see what happens there. Let me just make sure I didn't skip anything here. I think that's all the questions for now. Again, just um, let us know through an email if you have any other questions as well. And in the future, in the near future, in fact, we'll be doing more of these Zoom meetings. Um, it's just an e easy way to get the word out. It's an easy way to share information and uh, to get to know each other a little bit more. And I truly want you to understand that um, what is important to us, right? Clean grains from sustainable farms, from farmers that we already know and have relationships with. And uh, I love these little sidewalk chats that we have when you guys come to pick up your brains. Uh, feel free to ask any questions anytime when you come um, or through email or give us a call. Um, we love to talk about this. And so that um, education is just as important part of what we do as providing these grains to everyone. And so let me just switch back uh, to the contact list again really quick. So here's our contact information. Thanks for joining us tonight. And um, Another thing that we've had requests to do really quick is to do classes online. That makes perfect sense nowadays with uh, the pandemic and everything that's going on. So not quite sure when we'll get back in the classroom, but we are planning to do online classes. Some of the most popular classes that we've done are sourdough classes. Um, those are always fun classes where they're hands-on. If we have to do it over the, over the internet like this and over Zoom, then you can follow along uh, with what I do and uh, you'll have just as good a loaf of bread as what I make. And, uh, those are fun. But anyway, thanks for joining us tonight and we'll see you soon. Thanks.